you know, this the section on radiation safety, you know, you understand your dose limits, some great resources for looking up dose limits, important for staff dose. I would like to, you know, point out that these doses are effective equivalent doses. And what you're looking at is really talking about, you know, risk of cancer induction. And not, not, not. Doses as low as reasonably achievable, but that doesn't mean zero. So I think it's important for one thing I think about in designing a vault, and I'm not going to turn if, if you, if I, I think I'm getting a little background, so I can mute, that'd be great. Thank you. You don't have to have staff doses to be zero. You need to know your regulatory. For, for instance, we have a vault where during treatment, I have a meter out and the meter's reading, actively reading radiation. It's, it's shielded much like a pet vault, a little bit more than a pet vault, you know, positron emitting tomography machine. It, it, it's still, so we do get a little bit of dose, but it's in the, it's in the milliram region, but that can save you some money if you're looking at, you know, the cost of shielding. So a effective shielding design can really be a good thing to look at and still be safe and, and, and save, save money at the same time. Okay. So there should be inherent radiation protection built into the treatment unit itself and to the afterloader. Now, depending on what one you use, they're going to be different. I am, the, the thing I stress most is to know your own version. I had been working with the Gamma Med version a couple of years ago. And before that, I had worked with a microselectron from Nucleotron. And now I'm working with a Flexitron. And they each have, oh, most of the things are similar in the, the types of interlocks, but the way they look and the way they handle them can be different. So it's very yeah. important to do enough dry mm -hmm. runs with your machine to understand it because... One of the things I think about radiation safety that's the most important is to put yourself in a scenario where there's a radiation emergency or where you think there is one. And it's amazing how well a calm person can just lose it. You know, those hormones come up in your body, flight or, fight or flight response, and your brain goes out the window. So you want to have enough training and orientation with your unit that you can still access that in your mind. When your body's doing all this fight or flight stuff, you know, it, it's amazing how much you can forget in one of those situations. So I think, I think, I think radiation safety for afterloader should be simple and it should be drilled enough that you can do it. We don't want to make this complex. We just want to make this easy and we can be calm and respond in a, in a good manner. So got to know your, your own unit and your treatment room and bunker should have radiation protection measures built into it, like the shielding. You should have a door interlock that won't allow you to treat when it's open. The console should have interlocks. And I don't know about this in other countries, but the United States, we have an interlock that you can only use one type of radiation producing device at a time. That may differ. I don't know how other countries deal with that. That's one that we, we have. So these are things to, to look at and know. The afterloader, should have an internal safer storage, okay? Should have a manual source retraction. And we see that pointed on there. This is a Flexertron unit we're looking at right here. And you should have someone that trains you thoroughly on how to use that manual source retraction handle in case the source is out and stuck. Um, you should have a backup battery. That's very important. I know uh, some of you, you know, maybe working at in areas at some point where the the reliability of the power grid is not as great. That's the backup battery is very important then so that if the power does go out, it can retract the source back into its safe so that we can get it back out of the patient without you know, having, having any issues. We test that on a daily basis where I'm at and that should be part of your daily procedures to test that backup battery. We have a little switch wired in, we switch it and it cuts the power to the machine and after about 10 seconds, it'll retract in. But it does have a backup battery so that it can allow it to come back in. There should be a key interlock on the machine. It should have lockable wheels. That, you know, it's an important one. You don't want the, the machine, you know, pulling the catheters out of the patient while you're, while you're treating. And uh, radiation warning signage, of course. The treatment console should have, <clears throat> you're going to see an emergency off button, which you're going to want to test on a daily basis. You're going to have an interrupt button or this might be digital in the upper right hand corner that's a digital pad that's on the flexitron unit that would be have your interrupt on it or it might be an interrupt button on a console you'll have to know your own unit that should be tested if there's an interlock on the machine 
you're probably going to want to test it daily. And you need a key or passcode interlock for treatment initiation. That's important to have, you know, a, a unique one to the user. That That is something that, that should be done. The user should have their own unique, if, if you have a keypad, own unique input number. Some of you may not have that. You may just have a key to turn. And you might have a, a, a computer login. And those should be unique logins, though. All, all logins for, for the treatment should be unique or to the user. Treatment indicator, current source position and treatment time. So in the lower right-hand corner, this would be showing the, the treatment console of the Flexitron. This is where I think you really need to get oriented really well with your machine. How does it display where the source is? If I do have an interrupt, how do I know where it stopped? So that when I enter that room, if I have to, where that source is because I, it'd be very important to know where it's going to get stuck. It's also important to think about with your type of affloader, what is the most common type of, of problem? You know, it's a stuck source. Where's it going to get stuck? It's probably at one of those interfaces. So that's important to think about when you're, when you're doing a treatment. Now, if you're doing a treatment like in a new bronchial, it can get stuck in many places. So know your machine's treatment console and how it displays this information. Treatment plan information. You want to make sure before you do any, any treatment, you got to make sure you have a great timeout. I stress this. Some of the things that we do for safety seem that we do them so often and they seem so rare that you're going to have an issue that they almost seem silly that they're not. I, I can't stress enough the, the, it's the, the, you know, the checklists and the things that we do every day that make it safe. And, and you just do it every time, you know, you do a timeout every time you check the right patient, you check the your prescriptions, right. And you get that timeout and, and it's great. Portable radiation survey meter. You want to have a survey meter. We're going to go a little bit more over that, but what ones are appropriate and a stopwatch. You want to have a stopwatch so that if you do have to enter the room, one of the people in your emergency response team has a role of clicking to see how, much radiation you're receiving so we can do a dose reconstruction later. And we'll talk more about that. How, you know, what, I'll say it now because I'm going to say it again. When we have, if we had a radiation emergency where that source didn't retract in the safe, the people at risk, the person at risk is the patient. The physician and physicist are most likely going to get very minimal dose. And for the physician, if they do get dose, it's going to be the hands. So, which are, you know, more radio resistant than in terms of cancer induction than other parts of the body. At least we believe that. So we'll talk more about that later. The treatment bunker should have patient monitoring, TV and intercom. In the United States, we aren't allowed to treat without audio or visual communication. And I think that's a really, really good standard to have. I think it would be hard to know what's going on in your bunker without having that, that, that communication. You want an emergency off button, okay? It, and you'll need to test that daily. Door interlocks and a last man out button. You may have a last man out button, you may not. The current vault I have does not. So that's just a difference. Some states in America require them, some don't. So radiation detectors, the one you see right there is is one type where it shows you different states of where this, you know, green might indicate in the safe, one color might indicate out. That's more of a, that's kind of like a gamma knife. If anybody of you are familiar with that, they use a, that kind of radiation warning light. Other UIs, like in the vault that we have, it just has a radiation sign that says radiation present or something to that extent, and it lights up when the source comes out. That is adequate too. And then emergency equipment. You want to have an emergency container, what we, we call a pig in the United States. I don't know if that language comes in other places, but it's kind of funny, kind of funny thing. That I'm not quite sure the whole history on that. I don't know if one looked like a, uh, the container looked like a pig, but that's essentially what it, the lead container, you want to have a lead container to put it in. You want to have forceps and a suture cutter. Some people, this is a debate. Some people have a very long set of tongs. You can talk about it in your clinics. I, we go for the shorter set because we feel that if we had to go and grab the source or the source wire, Hi, we're more, yes.
I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I think I forgot to ask you this. Do you want me yes. to save the questions till the end or you would like to take them as they come? I, you know, I don't have the chat up there. Ooh, I see there's probably... Yes, um, somebody asked, what's the last man out button? So, oh, sure. Yeah. Let me see. I, I got the... Kelly Do asked, what's the last man out button? And you're also the co-host, so... Okay. Yeah. Hmm. You know, just a second. I got, let me, let me put my chat up here. So there we go. And then I'm going to go back to play. Okay. So yes, I will, we'll try to address the questions. If you have one, I'll, I'll glance at the chat. I have that up now. So the last man out button is a button that it's, you can install that has to be clicked before you can initiate treatment. And the idea is that the last person out of the room will click that button. And that person, if you click the last man out button, it's like on the wall in the vault. It means that I've looked around. I've made sure that I am the last man leaving the room, last man, last woman leaving the room. And so the last man out button is, is that it, it's not a bad idea. They're good. The state that I'm in doesn't require them. So we don't have them. I've worked in other places today. Or, or trained in other places they have had them, and I like them, but you may or may not have one. Emergency equipment. We had the pig, the forceps in, in, in the long tong, tongs, like, like a long forceps or tongs. I, I don't think we agreed that in our clinic that we're not as adept at grabbing with them. So we, we felt that we'd be in there longer trying to grab the source wire than, than a shorter set of forceps. So we chose those, the shorter set. Some people will choose a longer one. And I, I think that's, it, as long as you're trained on them and you can use them, that's fine. They're, 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 the one thing that I don't have on the emergency equipment is a wire cutter. That's, a, that's it, they used to, people used to keep them in their sets. You don't ever want to cut the wire. It, it's, for reasons we'll talk about later, cutting the wire will only lead to problems that, you know, I think the only time a wire would be cut would be for, by a service engineer at some point after everybody's left the vault. And even then, I, I don't know that they would do that. So uh, I, I don't recommend a wire cutter, and we'll talk more about that in the response. So poll question number one, which of the following does not constitute an HDR brachytherapy emergency? You have your choices there, a warning alarm displayed along with an error message, a dwell time has finished, but the treatment delivery Computer indicates that the source has not changed position. The physicist surveys the patient before treatment discovers radiation present, or the patient starts having chest pains during the treatment. So you can go ahead and answer. Okay, I'll give a couple more questions. Okay, I think we can we'll give a little more time here. And did, did you want to end that poll whenever you would like? I'm muted. Yeah, I'm. I'm just gonna give it a couple. Like, yep. I'll, I'll let you minutes. handle. I'll, I'll let you handle the poll questions because. Yeah. Yeah. Great. We have fifty-seven percent participation, so I want Great. to increase the participation a little bit. Sure. Yeah. All right. I will end the poll now. Sure. Okay. You want me to share the poll results? Yes, please. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this, this question is a little tricky and it might, might do to the way we're using the word emergency. Maybe we could say, which does not constitute an HDR event. And so, okay. So I think we're, we're good there. And could you take the poll question off? There? Oh, okay. For, for right. some reason, I can't get it to leave my Stop screen. sharing. Close it out. Are you okay? This is better? I can still see the question. I don't know. Oops. Go to the next slide, let's see, like your previous slide. Yeah, I'm there. Sorry. Oh, Wait. Okay. Now I, get, I got my, I got my <laughs> cursor back. For some reason, my, my mouse likes to, to leave every time I enter false. Uh, screen, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is a little tricky. So, and we're saying here, the radiation present, which is not a radiation HDR brachytherapy emergency. Or, or event, maybe. If you're surveying the patient before, which you absolutely should do, and you find radiation present, you, you know it's not from the HDR source itself. Because before that patient enters the room, you should be doing a survey as well to know that there's no radiation in the room. Then we bring the patient in, survey the patient. If I And the reason why we survey the patient 
is maybe they had a nuclear medicine procedure and we'll need to know that the baseline of radiation, then we can ask them about it. And the importance of that is, is that you don't want to get to the end of your treatment and find out that there's radiation and then wonder, is that from the source or did they have a new med procedure? It's going to be very, it's going to be more difficult to figure out the radiation from that at that point. So that we consider that one not to be a brachytherapy emergency. Let's quickly run through the other ones though. A warning along is displayed with an error message. It may not be an emergency, but it's definitely an event. It's going to tell you something that you need to be aware of. The most common one you're going to see is check source doesn't make it through because you have that check wire and it's going to be an occlusion. That's going to give you an error message. It's not, you're not going to have to have an emergency response, but you're going to have to respond to it. A dwell time is finished, but the treatment delivery computer indicates the source has not changed position. That, that's a radiation emergency. If the source is not pulling back, you need to, to hit that interrupt hit the emergency stop, go through the, your procedure. When the patient starts having chest pains during treatment, you need to hit that interrupt button. You know, that's a great thing about these units is that we can resume treatment. Now, if you had to come back a day later and resume, that would be a, you know, some radiobiology issues, but the, the management of the patient's immediate needs can, can be addressed and should be addressed during a treatment. Okay. So, Resources and references. There's lots of great resources and references out there, and we'll, we'll list a few in the coming pages. But I think certainly AAPM reports are great. Other institutions, you know, I think the medical physics community is pretty friendly. Finding what other people are doing. Um, you're going to get a lot from this presentation, so you can adapt that to your own situation. The types of emergencies that we'll want to address and that we'll want to have policies and procedures, and I can't stress this enough, Policies and procedures, concise. I, one of the big things in, in my radiation safety career and in just in general, I believe in, is that if you create policies and procedures that are too long, people won't read them, people won't follow them. It's just pragmatics. We're, we're all human. We, we, we don't have the ability during emergencies to hold volumes of information in our head. So make, make them count is what I, my, the point. I'm trying to drive home. Major emergencies, we need to have education and you should, you know, you need to look at your regulations, see how much education, how often a drill annually or semi-annually in terms of a radiation emergency would be a good idea. And we'll give an example of one here. So some references, APM Radiation Therapy Committee Task Group number 59, you should be able to find those published on the internet. United States Code of Federal Regulations, 10 CFR 35. I know that doesn't apply to you, but it's good to see what type of regulations are out there. If, if where you're at doesn't have, if you, if you feel like you want to get another perspective or want to see more information, that's something it, you know you could look at. IAEA Human Health Series number 30, ICRP documentation, and most importantly, your, your federal uh, or, or local regulations. You need to make sure that you're aware, whatever place that you're practicing in, that you are following all their regulations. Now, you can also you know, go above and beyond, but you need to meet the minimum requirements. For instance, in my state of South Dakota in the United States, there is no additional radiation therapy law or regulations. However, so we meet our minimum amount. We, we follow the United States guidelines, and then we actually go above and beyond. We've looked at other states, what they do. We looked at other regulations and say, hey, that's a great, great thing. We should be doing that too. So that, that's something you can do as well. But you need to meet the minimum of your local. There are hospital emergencies, medical emergencies, minor emergencies, and major emergencies. Okay. Hospital emergencies. You're talking about, you know, your, your fire, your flood, violent people, bomb threats. Unfortunately, I know that this is very true in, in, in parts of the world, and, and we need to have plans of what to do in those cases. Hospital institution immersion, emergency policies should be followed. So our policies obviously have to jive with the whole hospital. And we, you know, we want to review them at a certain periodically to make sure that they are up to date. They may result in power loss, and that's where that battery backup is really important. Medical emergencies. What do you do if that patient has that chest pain or, or staff? What do, you, what do you do if if your physicist has a heart attack while treating a patient? I mean, that's that's something to think about. In fact, I hadn't thought of that one until right now, and so 
I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, what would we do? I would think we'd have to have somebody interrupt the treatment. And so, you know, it'd behoove me to know, have the radiation oncology, oncologist know how to interrupt that treatment. I think that would be a, a good way to handle that. Depending on the medical issue, treatment may be reinitiated or may not be right away. When it's interrupted, a note should be made of the current status of the treatment. You want to document for it really so you can know what well position you're on, how much is treated, why you stopped, all that's important. Minor emergencies, abnormal device performance, an error code, they may be recoverable. Maybe you have something that you requires a computer to restart. That's fine. Or you may be requiring service and that, that would be unfortunate if you couldn't treat your patient. So you need to be familiar with the error codes and your vendor should, the, the person supplying you the machine should hopefully give you some manuals. If you're, if you're buying it directly from a vendor, you should get those. If you're buying it from a third party, I, I would contact the vendor to try to get those manuals. And if not, I would try to contact somebody that has the same unit and try to find out, you know, maybe some copies or, or some internal notes that they have on error codes. Examples include errors. You could have a kinked transfer guide tube on, or unattached. Your bunker door might not be closed or the last man out. If you have that switch might not be activated, treatment plan file could be corrupted. All those things might happen. Major emergencies will require physical intervention. You need to have procedures that are established and, and people that are, are trained on. I, I think that the training and drills are, are important. You don't want it to be one of those things where everybody's relying on somebody else to have read the emergency policy. You, you, you want to know it yourself. Emergency, emergency procedures must be practiced. Okay. And definitely with new staff, unfortunately, you know, people, teams change and you have turn, turnover. You need to, to make sure that, that all staff have been properly trained. So examples of major emergency, source stuck, failure of source to retract the safe or an applicator is broken. That, that applicator getting broken is probably one of the most realistic situations. If you had a doctor in certain applicator and it, it was under torque or pressure, you could crack. And if you didn't know, notice that it cracked and during the treatment, it just dislodged itself a little bit more. That to me is a very reasonable situation that might happen where you couldn't get the source to retract. So you, that's a good thing that you can drill. How are we going to, how are we going to handle that? When establishing emergency procedures, you need to consider the type of treatment and applicator. Certain emergency procedures might work for a tandem and ovoid, but not work for a tandem and ring. Sir, the easiest thing to pull would be a vaginal cylinder. If you had, I think it's the, the Y applicator and endometrial applicator, that might be a little more difficult. So you got to think about your response in these different situations. The equipment needed, where it's stored, okay? And how you're going to, where you're going to place it in the room. You want to, that pig is generally on wheels. You want to have that in a place so that when the doctor removes the applicator from the patient in an emergency procedure, they can put it directly into the pig. You don't want to have them to have to wheel that into position because you know every second counts. And remember, it's it's the patient that's getting the bulk of the dose. The dose to the patient, the dose to the staff. We're going to talk about dose to the staff. But if I enter the room as a physicist and I'm a meter away from that patient, I am I I can be in there for an hour before I get my yearly dose limit. You don't want that, but I, I just say that, and we'll talk more about those dose limits. It, it's really not. A, a staff problem. It's a patient problem for the dose. Source security is a big one. What are you going to do with that source if it's out and it's in that pig? Because it's no longer locked up. How are you going to secure that room? Are you going to have some other door you can lock? Are you going to post somebody until you can get a service engineer there at the door? And if you do post somebody from security, have they been trained? Those are things to think about in your institution, and it's going to be very institution specific. So types of treatments, different applicators we talked, and we just talked about the source is more likely to get stuck at different points in different applicators. The size and ease, and ease of remo removability, that is important. And the procedure should cover all situations. And once again, vendor guidance and documentation is helpful. Some of you may have limited communication with the vendor utilize somebody else, utilize me, utilize a, another physicist that you know, risk conscious. Yeah, I think that's important to do. So equipment needed outside the bunker, you need a portable survey meter. The one I've seen most likely 
used is a Ludlum 14C detector. It doesn't saturate inter, or it doesn't go dead. It'll say it might saturate on a certain scale, but it doesn't go dead where the needle goes back to zero where you can't see any radiation. This is a good meter for it. It's very, it's a pretty rugged meter. It's got the pancake, pancake probe we use, the 449. So it's a Ludlum 14C with a 449 probe. That's the classic one I've seen used, calibrated in 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 millirentgen per hour or millirem, you know, depending on where, how you're calibrating it. And you can, I guess these would be millirentgen per hour is, is how it is cal calibrated. And they should have check sort. You want to have it calibrated probably every two years if possible. I realize that's not going to be possible at some places, but that check source, the cesium source on the side will get you through if you don't have a chance to check it or send that meter in annually or biannually, that check source is there. I, I would recommend calibration as often as you can. I know that's not, not realistic in some places. A stopwatch to record a period of time that the source is stuck. That, that's important to have a stopwatch with you. I also would say for the meter, have a set of backup batteries on hand. They're, they're the, the big batteries that it takes, the D batteries, have a set of backup because that's common. most common meter failure is you run out of juice. You run out of electricity, the batteries fail. And, and so you can just replace those quick and, and go on your way. And so you should be checking that battery level every time you, you use that meter or two. Equipment needed inside the bunker, long handle forceps, that's how long you want that handle we've discussed. I think that's institutional. You should see what you're comfortable and what, you should go try to grab a wire with your forceps and see how long it takes you to pick up a wire and move it into the safe. You wanna use something that you can reliably pick it up and put it in the safe as calmly and quickly, I wouldn't say as quickly as possible. We don't want to be in there like racing and throwing stuff around. We want to go in there quickly and efficiently putting it into the, the pig. So I'd go in there, see how you can quickly move it into the, you know, if you, if it's hard to get, get the, the, the wire with the forceps, I would think about using a different one. Suture cutter. If you need to remove any sutures, that's important to have a little suture cutter. The physician may need to go in and snip the sutures out to remove the applicator. Because when we go on an emergency response, the best thing you can do is to remove that applicator if possible. Okay. Because then the source, you know, is in the applicator and can put it in. Okay. Or it might be in the transfer tube. You can think about how you want to do those. Shield and emergency container. We've talked about that. Always make sure the wire is never is still attached to the source. You, you don't want to cut the wire. Um, I know historically, some places have had, like I said, wire cutters in their kits. Do not cut the wire because if you are unsure of where that source is, you might cut the source. Then you have a serious problem. Or if you cut it distal or, or proximal, I guess, to, to the applicator and that source is in the applicator, now you have a source unattached to the treatment unit that's still in the patient. You don't want that. You want to have that source attached to that wire and then removing it all to the patient. I have yet to figure out a situation where I would cut the wire. If you can, if you can think of a situation where you cut the wire, I, I would love to know because that would change the way that I handle my radiation safety kit. But I haven't thought of one yet. So, And I, I've, I've asked a lot of people to help me think of one if we can think of one. So radiation dose, this is, these are great rules of thumb. I, I honestly, I can't remember exactly where I got these numbers. I can't remember if I calculated them or got them out of a, a report. I think I got them out of a report, but you can calculate them easy for a 10 carry source. You just look at your source strength, right? You're, you're, you're going to do dose or air kerma. In, in one minute at a centimeter, you get 732 centigrade. So I'm, I'm thinking about that physician going in there and moving that applicator out of that patient. If he can do that in a minute, that patient just got seven gray at that, you know, a centimeter from that, that source. So you got to fall off. So depending on what app you are, you know, and you'll need to reconstruct that. But the, the physician's hands are going to be what is, is most important. You know, at 10 centimeters, if he's 10 centimeters away in that minute, now he's got seven centigrade to his hand. That's a big difference. Okay. So that, that distance is huge. Remember in, in the fall off these sources, and I know, I know you know that, but I'm just kind of putting it out there. And at hundred centimeters, a meter, you're almost nothing. I mean, in terms of being in, in a room with a source, 
you know, you're looking in, in the, the milligrays, you know, 75 milligrays. I think that's, that's just something to keep in mind is that when we do initiate these responses, we need to keep our heads thinking about where is that source and, you know, how dangerous is, is this? Because I, as a physicist, if that, if that doctor needs a hand, I can go lend a hand. If he doesn't need me, I can step back to one meter and I'm, I'm very safe. And I'm still right there to lend a hand as he needs it. Something to think about when you're doing these emergency procedures. Your main concern is dose to the patient. You need to have your emergency response completed in one to two minutes. The dose re reconstruction of the patient may be required. Dwell time and position of the source is needed for accurate reconstruction. And one team member, maybe a nurse, maybe the therapist, maybe another physicist, I don't know, however your team looks, needs to record the time and, and roughly where people are in the room, when the applicator come out, they need to be knowing what goes on so that they can, we can reconstruct this dose at a later point to, to for our own safety as, as staff, but, but also for the patient. Largest dose of staff would likely to be incurred by the physician's hands. Talk about the forceps. And the security, you need to make sure you know what you're going to do with that source after the emergency response, because it's not going to be secure anymore. So you need to figure out, is somebody going to stay with it, or are you able to lock it up some other way? You need to make sure that you are communicating with your regulatory body with during a response like this and with, and with the vendor. So policies and procedures should be tailored to your specific afterloader model. Okay, you don't want to take... You don't want to take somebody else's procedures that are from a different model because they may not apply. There may be different things that, that are unique to that after order. Vendor supply information is great. They can provide a lot of flow charts and you can post those. You may want to adapt them. I've seen some flow charts that I didn't really particularly like because I thought they were too hard to read in an emergency situation. These, on the other hand, I did not develop these. Whoever developed these did a phenomenal job. I, I love these flowcharts. And I the reason why I love them is they are easy to read. If I'm the physicist and I have an emergency, the source is stuck, I lose my head. I everything goes, you know, I'm I'm panicked. All I have to do is look at that orange color and say, physicist, what do I do? And I can go down my line it's very quick. I I don't. Whoever did this is, is, I think this is great. So I would consider looking at something like this, training with something like this, and maybe even posting something, something like this tailored to your situation. And I would post them in the con at the console and in the treatment room, because then if I grab my meter and I go in, now I have something posted right there. If I, if I'm still really panicked and I can't, you know, I've lost, you know, all capacity to think. I can look at that and, and follow it. I think this is great. So education and drills. Initial education and drills should be developed with respect to a clinically realistic scenario. They can help identify areas that you need improvement. I've had lots of experience with that. We've done drills and we found out, oh, wow, we don't, we don't know how we'd address that. That would, would be a problem. So then we fix it. It's great. A refresher training and drills should be undertaken regularly, at least annually. So this is one... Um, I developed, you, know, you can do something similar. Just, I'm just going to talk about it. And, you know, we would go through this someday at work. It takes, you know, 20 minutes. During a tandem ovoid procedure, the source would become stuck in ovoid tube upon retraction. That's our scenario. All attempts to retract the source as listed in the emergency procedure fail. Uh, the treatment was complete only in the ovoids. I know that because the, the console and I was watching at all times as the physicist. That's an important part of your, your job to use. I'm, I'm very easily distracted. I have to very, during these procedures, I make sure that I'm watching my console. I, I actively have to reinforce that in myself. Note this is this scenario will be recreated by hooking up a transfer tube, running through part of a plan and interrupting the treatment using the interrupt button. This is our mock retraction failure. Then I have these drill roles, who, a nurse, a physician, and a physicist. I have people, and the other people watch and help us out. Then afterwards, we talk about what worked, what didn't work. How might this work in other situations or not work? And then we document who is present. And so here is a gamma med example of a drill from a couple of years ago I did. I'm hoping this video plays. Can, it, can you hear the audio? The audio is very faint on my end. Is there any way you can okay. hear that? 
I don't think so. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what's going on. Okay. I haven't figured out how to way to get the audio to come through very well. So I, I'm bear with me. I'll just kind of speak. So this is our gamma afterloader and we're going to have a, a mock issue with, with the source here. And you can see that, Oh, it's showing me the source is it moving or the check wire. We'll be simulating that it's gone through the ovoid, that ten and ovoid procedure, and it's going to get stuck in one of the ovoid on our tracks. So I, you can see the source is out now. Assume that the ovoid or the source is going to move the ovoid to get stuck. So we're we're saying that the source is stuck. You can see the prime alerts; those are radiation meters. Uh, the source is stuck. It didn't come back. I hit the interrupt button right there. Okay, I'm saying, oh, it didn't work. We still got radiation there. Of course, we don't have radiation there in our drill. I hit the emergency stop. That's part of our procedure. Still didn't come back. I have that radiation monitor on my camera I'm looking at. I grab my meter. I open the door. I'm the only one going in at this point. Okay. Taking my survey meter in. Taking my survey meter. Okay. And I'm going to go try the hand crank on this unit. Okay. I'm going to say that fails. Could you come and remove the applicator? I call the doctor in to come remove that there. Now, if somebody, if the patient's panicking, you might have to bring more people in. Notice the pig was in a good place. He didn't have to move it. He takes it and he okay. takes the applicator out, puts it in the pig. Come in and help get the patient. And then I request maybe the nurses to come in, help get my patient out. Now, if the nurses could be in the room at the, that time, if they're, you know, a couple of meters away, they're getting very little radiation. Notice that she's not near it and she's going to, I'm checking the prime alert there on the wall. And if I have a little lid for that pig, which would have been nice to have put on there. See, that's a, something I can improve upon on this. I, the, that prime alert might not have been going off, but it might have if there's radiation like outside the top of the source. Now, one thing I want to stop right here. I move that patient to our console area. Before I take that patient out, even though I saw that applicator go in that safe, I saw, you know, the whole process. I want to survey that patient right now. Because in these examples, weird things happen. And if for some, I don't know how it would happen, but if for some reason that, that source was still on that patient, I could identify that with my survey meter. So I want to stop before I take that patient and allow them to go farther out in the hospital. Stop in an area outside the treatment vault, get that door closed so that we know that we're not getting radi stray radiation from that vault. And then I want to survey that patient. Okay. We survey it with a the patient's great. There's no background, background radiation, or it's the same as background, I should say. Meter to survey the patient. We survey the patient. We look, hopefully we find no radiation. If we do find no radiation, we will dismiss the patient. We'll allow the patient to go out the door and then we will address the source. So, and that, that's, that is the rest of the emergency procedures. Now what we would do is we'd make sure that we get good, we review our documentation. We'd address the patient first, make a call to the vendor and call your RSO, your radiation safety officer. And then they will need to decide what regulation, whether they need to call a regulatory body or not. I view regulators as, I like to keep a health, a healthy, helpful relationship. If I had a source stuck out, in a pig, I would, I would call the regulators. I would, I would place a call and just thought, let them know, Hey, we didn't do anything wrong here. We're not in a violation. We're not like self-reporting violation, but what we do want you to know is we have this incident. And before that you do, you do want to call the vendor before you call the, the, any regulatory bodies, but you want to make sure that the vendor knows what's going on and that you can, you know, after this, all that happens after you have the patient safe and then you have the source safe or excuse me, the, the, the source safe and secure, whether that's going to be locked again in, in the room, hosting somebody that knows how to, to respond. Those are the, the ideas. So in summary, policies and procedures must be developed to address different emergencies. They should rely on vendor supply information and comply with your local regulations. You need to make sure you're aware of your own situation. Proper equipment must be readily available. Check for that equipment before every treatment. We all work in a hospital, we all know, or clinic, and we all know that 
equipment has a way of just walking off, you know, it, it, somebody needs a, a, a forceps and they take it out of your kit, you know, just check to make sure it's all there. An initial and refresher education and drills should be implemented. Last thing I'm going to say about, you know, the, the shielding is time distance shielding. Remember doubling the distance. We know that that reduces dose by approximately a factor of four. If you're talking about inverse square, double the time, you can double the dose. Only remain near the source or patient or even in the bunker when you're actively helping. If you're not actively helping, just take a step back. Or if you don't need to be in the bunker during response, that's, that's the best. But that, that step back is a big deal. Okay, poll question two, the final question. Place the following in the correct order. A physicist or the radiation therapist presses interrupt. This is being an emergency situation and emergency stop button. Or the radiation oncologist, or the next one is radiation oncologist removes the applicator and places it in the emergency container. A third is the physicist enters the room and turns the crank. And fourth is the radiation therapist, or it could be a nurse or someone else starts the stopwatch. So think about what order these things might happen in in a response. So after this, I believe we'll be taking some questions if you have them. And there might be a little bit of problem with the options and the, the, with the question and the answer and Mm -hmm. Our apologies for that, if, if that's so, but we'll, we'll go through it. So make a choice and, and we'll, we'll go through it and make sure that, make sure that you understand which ones that we did in our video, at least. Yeah, it looks like we might have a little problem with the sequencing options on that, but oh. it's, our, it's our drill. That's our room for improvement. So <laughs> yes, yes. There's true. always room for improvement. Always, Absolutely. Always. All right. Should we go through the. The answers. Let me see the time. Give a couple of seconds here sure. and I'll stop the polls. And, uh, Sounds good. Yeah. All right. End polls and share results. You want me to do that now? Sure. Okay. So I think there, so we're, I'm not too worried about the results because exactly. obviously we're learning and all. So obviously the, the, the options didn't quite match. I think, I think so the total, the, the total order that you'd want to have would be the, the last one, D. So what you do is you, the physicist would press or the therapist, whoever's delivering the treatment will press it, the interrupt and emergency stop. And then if those didn't work, we'd have someone start stopwatch. And after that, and you, you could argue that you could tell the person to start stopwatch when you hit the interrupt button, that I would take that argument that maybe four should be first type. So I, you know, that's that's up, up to debate. I think that's one of those things that we can talk about. And then the physicist would enter the room and try the crank. If the crank doesn't work, then you have to have the radiation oncologist actually physically remove the applicator. And that's kind of the last the last one. Good job.